have already devoted this service to Jesus Christ, and now it is prayer time, and if you're able to stand, let us rest to our feet for the Lord's Prayer.
This is Black History Month, where the theme is resistance. Check the display in the vestibule as you depart after the morning service. And these are your morning announcements. We encourage everyone to take the COVID-19 vaccine shot. Booster shots as well as the flu shots are available in Lake and Porter County. Please follow our safety guidelines. Remain masked. Please refrain from embracing and or handshaking. Please maintain social distancing. We want to keep everyone safe. We have some thank yous this morning. The Christ Baptist Church Whittles would like to extend love and great thanks to our pastor, Lawrence E. Robertson and First Lady Juliana for their heartfelt gesture of the Valentine's sweets received last Sunday. We thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you. Amen. Thank you. More than I can say, there are no words to express how grateful I am for my Christ Baptist family during the loss of my brother. Your calls and prayers were truly appreciated. Love, Deacon Benny and Deborah Connor. A great big thanks to all of you from the Jacobs and Taylor family and the loss of our uncle. We would like to thank Christ Baptist Church, our pastor, for all the prayers, cards, and calls. You are so very nice, Alvin and Dolores Jacobs and family. Amen. You know, it's so nice to be nice. Sunday school continues to be held on Sunday mornings by telephone conference calls. There are three classes each Sunday, 8 a.m., 8.30 a.m., and 12.30 p.m. New members on Tuesday at 5 p.m. and teenagers and young adults 11 a.m. on Saturday, Facebook Live. You don't need a phone number, you don't need anything. Just turn on Facebook Live and you'll see Sunday School. And you don't have to be a young adult. Just join them. Please call the church for the phone numbers to join. Social media, you don't have to belong to Christ Baptist to join us for Sunday school. You are invited. Please contact the church at 219-938-5504 for information. Information, the March Sunday school literature is available in the vestibule. For those of you who need it mailed, they've already been mailed. Likewise, social media and Christ Baptist family, Wednesday noon is Bible study. If you are interested in joining us, call the office at 219-938-5504 and provide your email to be notified of the telephone number to join and to receive the study guide. Our pastor will certainly welcome you. If you are celebrating your birthday today, are you celebrated your birthday this past week? Please stand so that we can celebrate with you. All birthday celebrants, please stand. Josh Wiley is extending an invitation to all Christ Baptist Church and friends
to celebrate with them next Sunday, February 26th, immediately following church at the new Jay's Birthday Club located at 2601 Broadway. Please call the church to reserve your seat. Let's support February and Jay's at their new location. There will be, there's dinner and breakfast served during that time. That's a black business, so let's support them. Reminder, Pastor Robertson has provided a fasting schedule for 2023, which is located in the vestibule on the table, as well as a prayer list. All are invited to join Women for Christ, along with our pastor emeritus, Reverend Colvin Blanford, as we study his book, God First for a Better Life, every Thursday virtually at 7 o'clock, and it's only for an hour. Men, you are invited as well. We will see you next Thursday at 7 o'clock. Nominations for Officers for Women for Christ are open until February 24th. Please contact the office with your nomination. We have Gary Literacy, Read Across America. They're needing volunteers. You are never too old, too wacky, too wild to pick up a book and read to a child. Dr. Seuss. Please contact the Gary Literacy uh, Coalition office to be a volunteer. They need you to call by February 24th. The phone number is 219-885-2229. And you will talk to our own Reverend Raspberry. Free. Tonight, this afternoon from 3 to 5, Jazz Sunday at the Gary Public Library. That's this afternoon, and it is free, and it's at the main library, 222 West Fifth Avenue, featuring the Thomas Matecki Band. Parking is also free. So if you don't have anything to do this afternoon, after you go out to dinner, stop by the library. Reminder, Thursday, men, there's a prayer meeting, men every Thursday at 6 p.m. here at Christ Baptist Church. Please come join them. These were your morning announcements. Black History Month features historic blacks who resisted the status quo by supporting black education and civil rights movements, working collectively to serve and strengthen, often making a way out of no way. Remember, we are black history 365 days of the year. In the meanwhile, have a wonderfully safe and blessed week. We will now have the welcome given by Usher Keisha Anderson. Are there any visiting guests? If so, please stand and remain standing until the welcome has been given. Any visiting guests? No? In that case, good morning, Christ Baptist. Welcome, welcome, welcome.
weight on my shoulders I pull it in my head Oh, I've got eyes in the back of my head Just in case I have to run
the hand their history. Amen. Amen. We have come to the point where we are ready to read the scripture. I'm asking that you turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 53. Old Testament prophet Isaiah. Mary Watkins is going to read the scripture for the morning. We're reading Isaiah 53, the King James Version. And if you're able to stand, let us rest to our feet for the reading of God's Word. Reverend Mary is here now to read the scripture. Good morning. Our scripture for the morning, again, is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, verses 1 through 5. And I will be reading from the King James Version. When you have it, say amen. Amen. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken smitten of God and afflicted. But, but, Mm -hmm. he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, and with his stripes, we are healed. May the Lord add a blessing to the readers and the hearers of his most holy word. Yeah. 
hands to the heavens, no man, no weapon, formed against, yes, glorious destined. Everyday women and men become legends, the sins that go against our sins become blessings. The movement is a rhythm to us, freedom is like religion to us. Justice is just a position for us. Justice for all just things typical enough. One son died, his spirit is revisited us. To a living, living is us. Resistance is us. That's why Rosa sat on the bus. That's why we walk through Ferguson with our hands up. When it goes down, we woman and man up. They say stay down and we stand up. Shots be on the ground. The camera panned up. Key pointed to the mountaintop and we ran up. One day, when the glory comes, it'll be ours, it'll be ours, oh, one day, when the war is won, we will be sure, we will be sure, oh, glory, oh, Under a ball ego, the biggest weapon is to stay peaceful. We sing our music is the cuts that we bleed through. Somewhere in the dream we had an epiphany. Now we write the wrongs of history. No one can win the war individually. It's just the wisdom of the elders and young people's energy. Welcome to the story we call victory. The coming of the Lord. My eyes have seen the glory. One day. Oh, 
this being Black History Month, and it used to be just Black History Week, where you only had a week to celebrate your culture. But now, even though it's the shortest month of the year, it's Black History Month. And But Black History is 365 days, 24-7, every day. Amen. I thank God for Reverend Mary Watkins reading the scripture so boldly and clearly for your understanding. Amen. And this Black History Month, this, this third Sunday in February, I'm asking that you keep your Bibles open to Isaiah chapter 53. And in your quiet time, read the entire chapter. But I want us to focus on verse 1 on those two questions that Isaiah Ask. He asked two questions. He asked, who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? In light of all the news that has occurred all around us in the past few weeks and months, all the bad news around us, the negative news as it pertains to our history and our culture, down in Florida, there are people who don't want to teach our history. Down in Florida, there are people who don't want to teach African-American history in their schools, in public schools, where African-American students attend. There is a movement not to teach African-American history in schools where African-Americans pay taxes to support those schools. The powers that be do not want AP African American history taught in the school. I'm offended because I was a US history and an AP US history teacher. And to say you don't want our history taught, there's something fundamentally wrong with that. Not only that, not to learn your history and for other cultures not to know your history is dangerous. When a black person doesn't know their history, when a black person, when an African American is not aware of the obstacles that their ancestors had to overcome, when an African American person is not in tune with the injustices and the mistreatment of their forefathers and their foremothers, what they had to endure, when you don't know your history, when, when they don't know that black men and black women and black children were chained and shackled, when you don't know that men and women were packed into slave ships, tight like sardines, when you don't know that millions of Africans died on the voyage in the Middle Passage on the way to America, when you don't know that Africans were taken from their homeland and taken from their mothers and fathers, never to see them again. When you don't know that they were brought to a place they knew nothing about to be abused by people of another culture. When you don't know that, when you don't know your own history, then you are doomed to repeat it. That's why we see five African-American officers down in Memphis 
chased down another African-American man for no apparent reason. Chase him down. These black police officers, they, they tase him, they mace him, and they beat him to death. It's because they don't know their history. When you see teenage black boys and black girls roaming the streets all night, and even in the midst of the day, carjacking a black mother or a, a black grandmother for a car and a few dollars. When our history tells us that there was a time when we looked out for Big Mama. There was a time we looked out for Grandpa and we looked out for the widows and senior citizens in our community. They don't know their history. It was a time when you, if you needed a few dollars, you shoveled the Widow Collins driveway. When you needed a few bucks in your pocket, you went over to old man Edward's yard and you raked his yard. What happened to those days when you went to the store for the widow Mrs. Bishop? What happened to those days? It seems that our history is fading away. And now there's a movement where people in high places don't want our history taught at all. We're in a dangerous time. And so this morning I want to preach and teach from the subject title, This is Our Story, This is Our Song. This is my story, this is my song. I want you to bow in a moment of prayer. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to serve you. I pray now, Lord, that you use me as you will and allow your word to go forth with boldness and understanding. Father, I pray that you allow everything that's said and done in this place be pleasing in your sight. Let your word go forth with clarity and understanding where your name is magnified and glorified, your people are edified, and your kingdom is advanced. This is my prayer. I'm your servant, and you're my God. And I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 This is our story. This is our song. In our scripture today, Isaiah begins chapter 53 by asking two questions. Isaiah begins by asking, who has believed our report? Who wants to hear our message? And then Isaiah asks a second question, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Let's look at question number one, who has believed our report? Who wants to hear our story? Who have accepted our communication? Who has received our information? You have to understand this major prophet Isaiah. Isaiah has been preaching God's justice since his calling all the way back in chapter one. God revealed to Isaiah in Isaiah chapter one, God revealed to him in a vision his concerns about Judah and the people of Jerusalem. God wanted his prophet to see the injustice and the unfairness that was on his chosen people. And so God shows Isaiah in a vision what will become of the people if they continue with this injustice. And then in Isaiah chapter six, in the prophetic book of Isaiah chapter six, God commissions Isaiah to be his messenger. You know the story in Isaiah chapter 6, when God gives Isaiah a vision of the Lord himself. When Isaiah says, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood seraphims, each one had six wings. With two wings, they, they covered their faces, with, with two wings, they covered their feet, and with two wings, they did fly. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And the post of the door moved and the voice of him that cried and the house was filled with smoke. Isaiah 
got a glimpse and a vision of the Lord himself. And then in verse six of Isaiah chapter six, then one of the seraphims flew unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, this hath touched thy lips. And thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin has been purged. In other words, now that I've touched your lips, Isaiah, you're ready to be my messenger. And God tells Isaiah to go and tell the people what thus saith the Lord. And now, in chapter 53, nearly 50 chapters later, in chapter 53, Isaiah asked the question, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Some 50 chapters later, who wants to hear our story? Who has received our communication all his life? The prophet Isaiah has been telling the story of the coming of the Messiah. All of his life, all these chapters, Bible readers know that the book of Isaiah has 66 chapters. Bible readers know that for 66 chapters, Isaiah has been telling the story of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For 66 chapters, the book of Isaiah is a microcosm of the entire Bible. The Bible has 66 books that tell the story of Jesus. The book of Isaiah has 66 chapters that do the same thing. Isaiah is the Bible's mini-me. In 66 chapters, Isaiah encapsulates the characteristic qualities of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But Isaiah is telling a story that nobody wants to hear. Isaiah is telling the harsh truth about how Jesus has to stand in for you, how Jesus has to stand in the gap for me and stand in for the sins of the world. Nobody wants to hear that. No. Isaiah is telling the history of how the Lord has to take on your sins, how the Lord has to take on my sins and the sins of the world. Isaiah is telling a story of how the Lord has to suffer and be judged and sentenced and punished for the sins of the people. And nobody wants to hear that. Who has believed our report? It is a story that is hard to accept. Who has believed our message? He tells the story of a man that is despised and rejected because of our sins. He tells a story and it's some harsh and hard news to receive. It's a difficult message. Every now and then, God's messenger has to deliver some hard news. Every now and then, God's servant, God's preacher has to deliver some harsh news. Every sermon, every message is not designed to make you shout. Every message out of the Bible is not for you to jump up and run down the aisle. Some messages are designed to convict you. And show you what you need to do to get right with God. That's why the Apostle Paul told Timothy, the young preacher Timothy, he said, be ready to preach in season and out of season. Preach when they like you and preach when they don't like you. Sometimes God's message has to, sometimes God's messenger has to deliver some tough news. Oh, I know I'm right about it. I know I'm right about it. Every now and then people want to come to church and hear a nice little soothing sermon on how to be happy, how to relax. They want to hear these nice little cheerful sermons. And they go out from here and say, oh, the preacher show preached today. What did he say? I don't know what he said, but he was showing up preaching today. I know I'm right about it because God's messenger every now and then has to deliver some hard news. I'm in Bible country because in Isaiah chapter 38 and verse 1, Isaiah has to deliver some bad and hard news to King Hezekiah. When he said to the king, the Lord says to get thine house in order. For thou shalt die and not live. Nobody wants to hear that. 
Nobody wants anybody to tell them to get your house in order. That preacher was meddling, telling me about my house. But God sent the prophet to tell King Hezekiah to get thine house in order. That's hard news. The prophet Nathan in 2 Samuel chapter 12, he had to deliver some hard news to King David when it was discovered that King David had committed a great sin. The prophet Nathan had to say to David, you are the one who is guilty of this sin. Every now and then, the messenger of God has to deliver some, some news that the people don't want to hear. And that's the world we're living in today. People don't want to hear about their shortcomings. People don't want to hear the truth. Nobody wants to hear about what they need to do to turn their lives around. Nobody wants to hear what they need to do to get closer to the Lord. Nobody wants to hear any constructive criticism. People today are so easily offended. People's feelings get hurt so easily. They want all the attention. You see it on Facebook. They post pictures of where they are, what they're doing, but you better not say anything. If you comment on it, now they're upset. People don't want to hear from you. They want you to see them and praise them, but they don't want to hear any constructive criticism, even if you're trying to help them. That's the world we live in today. Nobody wants to hear any tough news. Back in the day, we used to call it tough love. Back in the day when mama and daddy weren't ashamed to tell you when you were wrong. They didn't care about any tears falling out of your eyes. They would tell you, you're going down the wrong road. You're going in the wrong direction. And I'm going to tell you, as long as you're my child, I'm going to stop you. We're in a different day today. We're in a different day. Nobody wants to tell anybody any tough news. Oh, they would look you right in the eye. Mom and daddy would look you right in the eye. And, and they would even say, I don't care about them tears. I'm trying to get you straight. That's why the Apostle Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4 to preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. And here's what the word is to do. To correct, to rebuke, and to encourage with great patience and careful instruction. And then the Apostle Paul goes on to say, for a time will come, and we're in that time now, for a time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, they will suit their own desires. They will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Nobody wants to hear the truth. And so Isaiah is delivering the hard truth about Jesus Christ. Look at the record. Look at the record that Isaiah lays out from verses 2 through 12. It sounds so negative. Look at the record in verse 2. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. A dry ground and he has no form, no comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire. This is the Messiah. This is the Son of God. And Isaiah says, but he comes out of dry ground. How can a tender root come out of dry ground? That's a dichotomy there. How can a tender root come out of dry ground? What he's saying is this is the Lord who comes from a dry place. He comes from almost no place, from, from no place, from Nazareth. Remember the disciple Nathaniel. When Philip went to Nathaniel in John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 46, and said, we, we have found the Lord, and he wanted to introduce Nathaniel to Jesus. And he told Nathaniel that Jesus was from Nazareth. And Nathaniel said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? A dry place. Nazareth was a dry place, sort of like Gary, Indiana, my hometown. <clears throat> Gary, Indiana is portrayed in such negativity as such a dry place, like Gary, Indiana is a no place. But I stopped by to tell you this morning that the greatest entertainer to ever live came out of Gary, Indiana. The greatest entertainer, the Jackson Five and Michael Jackson, 
All the little jay birds on Jaybird Street hopping and a bopping, going tweet, tweet, tweet. Talk about Michael Jackson today. Somebody who danced with his whole body. He would dance with his head, everything. The greatest entertainer in the world came out of my hometown. A dry place. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Gary, Indiana? And then going on in the scripture, Isaiah said he has no form or comeliness. That word comeliness means attractiveness. No beauty. It means he's not handsome, something to look upon. In other words, when Jesus comes on the scene, he didn't come here to be cute. When Jesus comes on the scene, he didn't come here to be the object of your eye. He didn't come here to say, oh, look at me. He came here. He was despised in verse 3. He was rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Why? He came here to be our suffering servant. He came here and took on the sins of the world. Verse 4, surely he bore our griefs. He carried our sorrows, yet we did his esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. He took on our sorrows, he took on our issues, he took on all of our pain, and we thought that God was punishing him because of something he did. That's why the thief on the cross on Calvary said to Jesus, if you be the son of God, you save yourself and save us. Because he thought Jesus was just as guilty as he was. But then there is a transitional phrase in verse 5. There's a word of transition in that word, but, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. The understanding of why he came. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. He was beaten and scorned. He was wounded, crucified, and buried. Who wants to hear about such a story? Isaiah said, who will believe our report? When he asked that question, the parallels of our history are striking. No one wants to hear our history. No one wants to hear our report. Why? Because there's so much negativity in it. When you talk about slavery, nobody wants to hear that. When you talk about sharecropping and mistreatment, no one wants to hear that. But our history must be told. There are some hard things to accept in our history, but our history must be told. This is our story. This is our song. Since we're in a nation where one culture wants to dominate and has positioned themselves as the lead culture, there are some things that we all need to do. There are three things that, we, that need to take place in this culture. We need to know their history. They need to know our history. And we all need to know his history. We need to know their history. They need to know our history. And we all need to know his story. We need to know their story. We learn their story the day we enter school. We learn that English is the number one language. We learn the Pledge of Allegiance from the time we go to kindergarten. The stories we learn about George Washington when he was a boy said, I cannot tell a lie. I chopped down the cherry tree. We learned those stories. We learned about the founding fathers of Washington, Jefferson, and Madison. We learned about the Revolutionary War and the spirit of 76. We learned the Star Spangled Banner. We learned about early explorers like Christopher Columbus. We learned about the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. We learned about the Mayflower and the Pilgrims. We learned their story. We learned about the 13 colonies. We learned about the midnight ride of Paul Revere. 
One it by land and two it by sea. We learned, we learned, we learned about their history. We learned about Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin. We learned their story because it's part of the curriculum. We learned about the Civil War. We learned about the Battle of Gettysburg, the Battle of Manassas, the Battle of Bull Run, the Battle of Vicksburg, the Battle of Shiloh. We learned their history. We learned about General Robert E. Lee and how a great general he was, even though he lost the Civil War and surrendered. We learned their history and they need to know our history. They need to know the harsh realities of our history. You can't learn U.S. history without learning African-American history. And their, their history is our history. We're all tied together. You can't talk about Christopher Columbus without talking about a man named John Baptiste de Sable. You can't talk about George Washington and the founding fathers without discussing a black man by the name of Richard Allen. You can't discuss and teach the Revolutionary War and leave out a black man named Crispus Adams. You can't teach about Thomas Jefferson without talking about his slave wife, Sally Hemings. You can't discuss the Civil War battles without a lesson on the 54th Massachusetts, an all-black regiment. Teaching World War I without discussing the Buffalo Soldiers is an incomplete lesson. You can't have a World War II lesson without talking about the Tuskegee Airmen. Our history is tied up with their history. African American history is U.S. history. Our history is woven and sewn in to American history. Dr. Martin Luther King said in a speech in 1967, we are all bound together in a single garment of destiny. In other words, we are in this together. And one culture cannot dismiss the history of another culture and then live side by side with that culture. Dr. King said, before you leave the breakfast table, you have interacted with half of the world. He said, you can't live on an island. One culture can't say that another culture's history is not important. And I researched and he's right. You can't leave the breakfast table without interacting with other cultures in the world. If you drink coffee in the morning, you're interacting with somebody from South America. Perhaps you like tea in the morning, then you're interacting with somebody from China. Maybe you like hot chocolate or cocoa in the morning, then you are relating to somebody in Africa because the cocoa plant is grown in Africa. You can't leave the breakfast table without engaging with other cultures in the world. If you like toast, you ought to thank. If you like toast and marmalade, you ought to thank an Irishman. Or maybe you like an English muffin, or Danish pastry, or French toast, or Belgian waffle, or Italian sausage, or Canadian bacon. You can't leave the breakfast table without engaging other cultures in the world. Even your discussion about dinner tonight, when you say, baby, what you want to eat today? Baby, you want Italian food or Mexican food? You want Chinese food or soul food? Or maybe you just want a hot dog. You can't go to the table without engaging the rest of the world. We need to know their history. They need to know our history. And we all need to know his story. That goes back to verse 1 in Isaiah chapter 53. In Isaiah chapter 53, Isaiah asks two questions. We have addressed the first question, who has believed our report? It's a hard report. It's a tough report to receive. But now we need to address that second question. The second question is, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? That is an important question. For who has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Because when you see in the Bible the phrase, the arm of the Lord, 
that, in its, that is an expression of God's justice being extended. When you see in the Bible the hand of God, the hand of God is an expression of God's righteousness. In Isaiah 41, God says, I'm always with you. God said, I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. Whenever you see the hand of God, that's God's righteousness. Whenever you see the eye of God, that's God's providence where God is watching over you. Whenever you see in the Bible the breath of God, that's God's spirit because God's breath gives life. And when you see the arm of God, that is an expression of his justice. The arm of the Lord in the Bible means that God sends somebody to help you in the midst of injustice. The prophet Isaiah is an extension or an arm of the Lord. Those who seek justice and preach justice are an extension and an arm of the Lord. When Rosa Parks sat down on a bus down in Montgomery, Alabama, when she refused to give up her seat because of an unjust law, when she refused to obey that unjust law, she was extending the arm of the Lord and his justice. When young people were marching down in Birmingham, Alabama for civil rights and voting rights, when they had the dogs turned on them and water hoses from the fire department turned on them, they were extending the arm of the Lord's justice. When Dr. King was marching and protesting for civil rights and human rights, Dr. King was extending the arm of God's justice. To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? When you look at your history, when you look at their history, you can see that the arm of the Lord has protected all of us. The arm of the Lord has kept all of us. The arm of the Lord has saved all of us. Without the arm of God, there would be no history. Without the arm of God's justice and power, they wouldn't have a history. We wouldn't have a history. That's why we need to know their history. They need to know our history. But we all need to know his story. His story is the gospel story. Oh, you may reject my story. I may not want to hear your story. But you better not reject his story. His story was when we were sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, when we needed a day's man. And the Lord said, who shall go and who shall I send? I'm so glad that Jesus said, here I am, send me. That is his story. You may reject my story, but I'm going to tell his story. I'm so glad that one day in glory, that Jesus took off his royal diadem. One day in glory, he exchanged time for eternity. That is his story. I'm glad to tell his story. He came down through 42 generations, was born one cold December night in Bethlehem of Judea. I'm so glad that he took on flesh and blood. He was born in a stable laid in a manger, wrapped in swaddling clothes. John said the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That is the gospel story. That is his story. He grew up and went about doing good. And one day he decided to die for my sins. One Friday evening, he went to Calvary with a thorny crown on his head and an old rugged cross on his back. I'm going to tell his story. He went up to Via Della Rosa, up to Golgotha. They nailed his hands and they nailed his feet. They pierced him in the side. They hung him high and they stretched him wide. I'm going 
gonna tell his story. The record is he died, and the sun went out like sackcloth of ashes. He died, and the moon refused to shine. He died, and hell got happy. Heaven went into mourning, and the earth rocked and reeled. He died, and the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom. He died, I said he died, didn't he die? He died for you, he died for me, and he died for the sins of the world. They put him down in an old dusty grave. That's his story. Stayed there all night Friday, all day Saturday, all night Saturday night. But thanks be to God, that early Sunday morning, I said early Sunday morning, early Sunday morning, he got up, stepped out on resurrection ground, raised his hand. That's his story. All power, all power, all power, all power, all power is in his hand. Healing power, redemption power, forgiveness power. Mercy power, grace power, second chance power, salvation power, power power. All power is in his hand. We need to know their story. They need to know our story. But we all need to know his story. This is my story. This is my song. God bless you. God bless your hearts. I thank God for his word today. On the strength and power of God's word. On the strength of the preached word. I offer the invitation to discipleship. Now is the time and this is the place. To give your life to Jesus. The doors to my father's house are open. Won't you come? Won't you come? Give your life to Jesus. The doors to my father's house are open. Man, woman, boy, or girl. Unchurched, unsaved, or uncommitted. Won't you come? It's all about you now. The invitation is yours. come as a candidate for baptism. You may come on Christian experience, reaffirmation of faith. You may come in search of a church home. We will welcome you with open arms. Won't you come? The doors to my father's house are open. The choir is singing. Ministers are in the aisles to greet you as you come. The deacons are waiting for you. To our friends who are watching by way of social media and on the on the network, the TLE network, we thank God for you. I offer that same invitation to you. The Bible says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. Make that confession today. And my prayer is, once you make that confession, that the Lord put a covering on you and order your steps from this day forward. Make that confession. And once you make that confession, make sure you get into a good Bible reading, Bible teaching church. We would love to have you here at 4700 East 7th Avenue, Gary, Indiana. But if you can't make it here, make sure you get under the tutelage of a good Bible teaching church. God bless you and God keep you. In Jesus' name, amen. Not too late. The doors to my father's house are open.
the word today. Thank God for strength and health. Grateful to God for his divine revelation. This is a time we set aside for reflection and meditation. Where our music director Chris Sims and our musicians play for us musical meditation. Where we allow the word of God to fill the sanctuary and penetrate hearts. It's meditation time. We can thank God for all that he's done for us.
God for it. We ought to give God another hand praise for Brother Joshua Wiley. Channeling our ancestry, our past, there was a time when church didn't have the elaborate pianos and organs. Someone may have had a harmonica and the congregation just clapped their hands and patted their feet and praised the Lord. Amen. I thank God for that rendition. Amen. Amen. It's prayer time. And Sister Stephanie Hewlett is here now to give us the spoken prayer request for the week. Pastor Christ Baptist Social Media, we ask that we all continue to pray for those on our prayer list as the names scroll across the screen, as well as any and all unknown prayer requests. This morning we had Sister and Brother Thurman and Ann Eldridge on the prayer list for health concern and to be God be the glory. They're sitting here this morning. We have praise reports. We have praise reports. Also, we've been asked to pray for our own Milton Ward. Even though they've moved to Georgia, they're still our wards. Mm -hmm. So please keep them lifted up in prayer as well. We all know what's going on in the nation. Continue to keep our young people lifted up. That 13-year-old young man that they found dead at a church, and he had been chased from social media, Let's please keep our young people lifted up, not just in Gary, but all over the world. Amen. We've got them still buried under an earthquake. But guess what? They brought some of them out after four or five days when they had given up. So we serve a God that knows exactly what he's doing. Specifically, we ask that you continue to pray for our bereaved families. It is with heartfelt sorrow and deepest sympathy that we announce the following. The transition of Mr. David Connor, brother of our own deacon, Benny and Deborah Connor, Annie Jones, as well as the uncle of Militia Henderson and Mackenzie De La Hunte. All services were held yesterday, February 18, 2023 at Van Buren Baptist Church. Continue to lift them up. Also, please lift up Pastor, the family of Pastor Charles Meekins. That's the, the husband of our speaker, Arena Meekins. Continue to lift that family up. Services will be this week sometime. Pastor, those are the prayer requests this morning. Amen. Church, you've heard the spoken prayer request. And we all stand in the need of prayer. I want to pause and thank you all for your prayers and concerns about my eye surgery. It went well, as I said earlier. But the doctor said with the surgery on the eye, the socket will remain swollen for a few more weeks, several weeks. But, but it's healing and it's healing properly. And I thank God for your prayers. And I thank God for my wife, Juliana, who has been nursing and taking care of me around the clock. I thank God for you. Amen. You're an angel of mercy, and I thank God for you. It's prayer time. I want us to pray for our young people, as you heard Sister Stephanie say. Pray for our community, our city, our state, our nation, and our world. Pray for peace. Because there's so much going on around us with objects flying over us and surveillance balloons and all these things that could trigger a war. Pray for peace. Pray for those who are in leadership. As the Bible says, pray for those who are in authority so that it may go well with us. Pray for the person in front of you, the person behind you, the persons to your left and to your right so that all in the house I'll pray for. It's prayer time, and Deacon Mario Green is coming now to render the altar prayer. Let us stand for the prayer if we're able. Father, in the name of Jesus, 
We come down before your throne of grace, Father God, just to say thank you, Lord. Lord, to thank you for this day, for this is the day that you have made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you for the sun shining upon us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you touched us with your finger of love this morning and allowed us to rise, Father God, clothed in our right minds, Father God, with the desire to come out to the house of the Lord one more time. We just thank you, Father, for your goodness and your mercy and your grace, Lord. Father, you've been so good to us. You've had us, Lord. You've kept us from the cradle up until this present time. And we just want to give you the glory. We want to give you the honor. We want to give you the praise. Father, you've loved us so much that you sent your only begotten son to be that sacrificial lamb to bleed on Calvary so that wretches such as we might be redeemed before thee, Father. And through the power of the resurrection that we might have the right not only to the tree of life, but eternal life. And we just thank you, Father. We just give you the glory, Lord, the honor and the praise. Father, we had a thousand tongues. We couldn't thank you enough for your goodness and your mercy and your grace because you've been so good to us, Lord. Oh, Lord, we just love you so much, Father God. Oh, we can just give you the glory. We give you the honor and we give you the praise. Father, right now, we just ask that you create in each of us a clean heart and renew in each of us a right spirit. Build us up where we're torn down. Strengthen us where we are weak, Father. Empty us of self, Father God. If there be anything that's in us that's not like you, we ask, Lord, that you would just remove it, Father, and then fill us with your precious Holy Spirit. Father, give to each of us a desire, Father God, to, to do your will, Father God, to work for the upbuilding of your kingdom. Oh, Lord, we just need you so much. Oh, Father God, we just thank you that you've said that we could come and come boldly before your throne of grace in order to obtain help in a time of need. And Father, you know we're living in perilous times. We're living in evil times, Lord. We live in times when we have, we thank you that we have a Savior that we can come to. And Father God, we just want to come, first of all, lifting up one another, Lord. We just lift up ourselves, Father God. Lord, each and every one of us, Father God, you know our hearts, you know our desires, you know what our needs are, Lord. And we're asking, Lord, this morning that you meet each of us at our point of need. Father God, we lift up those who had a desire to be here and aren't here. We lift up those, Father God, that are in the hospital, those that are sick, Father God, those that are lying on their in their beds, Father God, those that are at home that are ill, Father God, those that are in the nursing home, Father God, you know all about what each and every one of us have a need of, and we ask, Lord, that you heal, Father God, because we know that you're able. Father God, I want to specifically lift up our pastor to you today, Father God. Lord, you know he's been sick, Lord, and I just thank you, Lord, for the bold message that he gave to each and every one of us, Lord. Lord, we ask that you would just touch him, Father God, continue to encourage him, Father God, and I want to lift up his wife to you, Father God. Lord, just continue to bless her, Father God, as she tends to him, Father God, and encourages him. Lord, we have a need, Lord, and we just ask now, Lord, that you just bless this sin sick world, Father God. We pray, Lord, for every city, Father God, every state. Every nation, Father God, we lift up every leader of every nation, Father God. You said in your word, we must pray for those who are in authority that we may be able to get along one with another. Father God, we just lift up each one, Lord, that they're not there for vain glory and power, Lord, but they're there, Father God, for the reason that they were placed there. And that is to be an encouragement to each of us, Father God, and to represent each of us. Lord, just have your way, Father God. Lord, we just need you so much, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that you just have mercy on each and every one of us, Lord. We pray, Lord, for every church that's open in your name, Lord. And we want to just lift up Brother Ward to you before I forget, Lord. Touch his body, Father God. Heal him, Father God. You know all about him. You know what his needs are. And we ask, Lord, that you touch him right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, we just love you so much, Father God, and we just pray, Lord, that you just bless each of us, Lord, at our point of need. And Lord, we'll be forever glory. We will forever give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Amen. It is that glorious time of our worship where we are able to give our tithes and offerings unto the Lord. And for those who are in the sanctuary, you know that we have two boxes at the back by the exits where you can place your offering envelopes. For those who are on social media, you will see a variety of ways of, of scrolling across the screen in which you can continue to support and give to your church. And not only that, but we ask that you would hit the subscribe button, hit the like button and share this word because there is something that someone needs out of that word. So we thank God for you. And so now let us let us go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come to you with hearts filled with thanksgiving, Lord God. Father, we thank you that all that we have needed, your hands has provided, Lord God. And so right now, Father, as we take these offerings, these tithes, Lord God, we pray that you would bless both the gift and the giver, Lord God, that no one would lack because of their giving, Father, and that you would continue to increase, Father, that you will continue to multiply, Father, that all of these offerings would go to the building of your kingdom here on earth. And we will be careful, Father, to give you all of the praise, the honor, and the glory, for only you are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. Were you blessed by the service today? Amen. Aren't you glad you came out to the house of worship one more time? Amen. Amen. I'm glad that your minds didn't drift while the word was going forth. You know you've already made up your mind, your mind as to what's for dinner tonight, whether it's Mexican food or Chinese food or Italian food, seafood, whatever the cuisine is, enjoy your meal this afternoon. Amen? Amen. Let us, let us now prepare to go out from this place, but not out from his presence. As we rest to our feet for our closing music and benediction. Father, we thank you for all that our eyes have seen. We thank you, God, for all that our ears have heard and all that our hearts have felt. We thank you, Lord, for every song of praise. We thank you for the opportunity to render prayers unto thee. And we thank you for the word today. But we especially thank you for Jesus. And now as we prepare to go out from this place, but not out of your presence, we ask and pray, O oh God, that you go with us and stand by us. Now may the grace of God as Father and as Son and the sweet communion of God as Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide in each of these thy people now, henceforth, and forevermore, world without end. And all of God's people can say together, Amen. Amen.